feet. Give your best welcome for our precious friends, Brian and Candace Simmons. Thank you. Have a seat, everybody. Where did that hour of sleep go, you know? <laughs> Give it back. Wow, it's good to be back. We just love being here at Harvest Time, your family to us, and now we're honorary members. I like that, card-carrying members. And uh, you'll, there's a little bit of story behind, behind uh, you know, the back story, and I'll give that to you later. But Pastor Glenn and Denise, thank you so much for hosting us. Is there anything not to love about these guys? Can you give it up for your pastors? They're incredible. Absolutely tremendous. I work with leaders around the planet, and I'm telling you, these are some of the finest. You are really blessed. You've got a great staff, and uh, aren't they good bosses, staff? Yeah. yeah. Good man right here. So we're just so thrilled to be back, and uh, I know you're, you're, you're like staring at this drop-dead gorgeous woman next to me. Uh, she's been my favorite wife for 40, almost 43 years. Her name's Candace. Would you welcome her? Good morning. We're so happy to be back. And as I said at the second service, we count you as our BFFs. <laughs> we love you so much. But uh, we are always happy when we get to come home here. You know, as he said, we've been in Connecticut we're 18 years. We've just recently moved uh, to where our parents are to help out with our elderly parents. But... Uh, I just want to say how much I've enjoyed being here and the sweet hospitality and love that you've shown us. And uh, I just want to share a word from the Lord that he gave me last night. And uh, my husband and I, uh, we hadn't talked to any of the staff or anything about your building program, but we were just talking among ourselves because we knew you had one. And uh, lo and behold, I had a dream about your building uh, program that's going on. So I just wanted to share that with you this morning. Uh, what I saw in my dream was people in this congregation selling jewelry and uh, looking for ways that they could give into this building program and so sacrificially. Now when we had a building program, the Lord spoke to my husband and I to give up our Mustang convertible of all things. <laughs> that was like our prize. Uh, <laughs> my husband had actually, it's a long story, but we were hit by a train and it was uh, totaled. So he always felt like it was mine, actually, when we got, went into the marriage, it was my uh, Mustang con convertible. So he always felt like he owed it to me. So he, he bought me one. And then the Lord asked us to give that up. And it was one morning before service. Uh, I was up and I was, you know, praying. And the Lord said, I want you to give that convertible for the building program. And then my husband comes into the living room and he says, I hate to tell you this, but the Lord just spoke to me that we were to give our Mustang convertible for the building program. And I said, well, that's fine, because he just spoke to me the same thing. So uh, I just see that the Lord's going, <laughs> he's going to use your sacrifice. And I, as when I woke up from that dream, I saw the children of Israel coming out of Egypt, and they were heavily loaded with silver, down with silver and gold. So I know that the Lord is going to provide everything that you need to give. So uh, just so in faithfully to it. And I also got a vision of them going through the wilderness and their clothes never wearing out. Uh, they never got sick. The Lord provided everything that they needed, the water out of the rock, the manna from heaven, and he's going to provide for you everything that you need. So don't have any worry. If he calls you to sow your Mustang convertible, he's going to provide everything and more. We don't have a new Mustang convertible. We have so, he's just blessed us, heaped on blessing after blessing on us. We have no a need that we're not wanting in any way. He's so faithful, and he's going to be faithful to you, and he's going to provide for you over and above. He's going to bless this church. The Lord said to me, you build it, and they will come. The nations are going to stream in. Revival is going to be poured out, and God wants to fill that building with souls and people that need to be healed and the nations. So Lord, just bless this building project. It's on his heart this morning. I just want to let you know that that's what's on his heart, is for this building to go forward so that it can hold the nations of the earth. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, sweetheart. 
That's so true. God is such a faithful God, isn't he? Um, I want to just pick up where uh, Pastor Glenn left off about the Passion Translation. Uh, I did have a commissioning from the Lord a few years ago after we turned our church over to our kids and a younger generation. And it's like, God, what do I do now? And uh, the Lord really, when I say he spoke to me, I'm understating it. He spoke to me and made it clear uh, that he was behind this project and that he would help me and that I would be persecuted. So that was his promise, and it's coming to pass. He's helping me, and the other stuff's happening too. But uh, I love the Word of God. I absolutely cherish the Word of God. Uh, when I was a new believer, the first few years of my Christian faith, I memorized 17 books of the New Testament. I absolutely love the Word of God. I had the privilege of translating uh, the New Testament into the Payakuna dialect uh, of South America. I was thrilled to be a, a co-translator to that project. And uh, now... Walmart has contacted me. You ever heard of them? And they uh, want to put Psalms and Proverbs, uh, a combined edition, into every Walmart and Sam's Club store by uh, fall of this year in time for Christmas. So, yeah. So I'm giving up going to Target. I've been a faithful Target shopper. Now I'm going to Walmart, baby. Uh, <clears throat> I'll get my shaving cream from Walmart from here on. But um, I had the privilege in January, Bill Johnson, myself, Cheon, Dr. Peter Wagner, we were in Seoul, South Korea, and we dedicated the first edition of the Passion Translation in Korean. And the book of Psalms, which I have here, I think it may be the only one left uh, on the table back there, but uh, we dedicated that into the, the uh, Korean language. Since then, I've been contacted by translators that I'm working with concerning Mandarin. A Chinese version. And some of these translations have never really been uh, revised or changed for like maybe 50, 60, 70 years. They're quite old, and especially the Korean translation, they tell me the Koreans don't even use it because it just, they use Chinese letters and they don't like that, and it's old language and it's not how they talk anymore. So this translation, I believe, is going to rock the world. It's a movement that's begun uh, bringing the Word of God into a new dynamic equivalent, a relevant translation for a contemporary generation, and you and your kids and grandkids if you can think that far down the road, they're going to be reading for the Passion Translation. So I want to come back 2017 and give you, uh, Glenn and Denise, give you a, a leather-bound copy of the New Testament Psalms and Proverbs 2022. We, will, we hope to finish the entire Bible. Everybody say, you sound like you're a busy person. Um, I can't wait till tomorrow. I, I, we jump on a plane here in just uh, a couple hours. And uh, we're going to, you're, you're, you're lucky there because we've got a deadline. I have to be out of here. So you're, you're fortunate that I scheduled it that way. But I can't wait till tomorrow to begin uh, to finish Hebrews chapter 3. I'm doing the book of Hebrews right now. And, um, you know, somebody needs to start a coffee shop called Hebrews. Anyway, that's okay. That's all right. <laughs> my kids don't like my humor. I don't think my church did either, but they had to put up with it. What are they going to do, you know? So uh, that's one thing. Uh, thou shalt get the Passion Translation. You can get it on Kindle. Uh, Bill just texted me in the first service, Bill Johnson, and uh, gave me his uh, endorsement. Wait till you see the cover page. This, this is an okay cover, but the Walmart version, oh, I really like it. I'm kind of passionate about the Passion Translation. Is that okay? I'm just really thrilled about what God's doing. I love the scriptures, and I think you need to fall in love with the Bible. You will when you start reading it in a way that, that zings you inside. You know, God has a lot to say if you'll be open to hear it. Now, the second thing I want to say before I get into my, my uh, quickie, my sermonette for Christianettes here today, I want to talk about the Israel trip. We are going to Israel. You're going to take communion with me at the empty tomb. Uh, your pastor is going to be a part of our, our tour, and uh, you'll be on a bus with us together. It'll be awesome. It'll be tremendous. You're going to dance on the Sea of Galilee on a sailing ship as we go out, and we'll eat Peter's fish, actual descendants of the fish that Jesus multiplied. Great, great, greats. You're going to eat those guys, and, and it's awesome. 
And, and all the vegans can eat some Peter's fish. It's really good. Um, we're going to go to Carmel where the fire fell. We're going to see where Jesus multiplied the bread and fish. And we'll take you to Tel Dan. Tel Dan. That's an actual place up in northern, uh, near the border of Lebanon. And uh, you're gonna, we're going to show you some secrets uh, about the Word of God there at Tel Dan. And we will uh, go to, uh, we'll go to Shepherd's Field at Bethlehem. Of course, it's just going to be awesome. Uh, you'll get to, you ladies will get to smear all of the red, the Dead Sea salts. What is it? Ahava? Ahava? Nagila? You're going to get the Ahava all over you. And uh, you'll come back younger, prettier. You'll have, you'll be skinny. And, and if you're bald, you'll, you'll grow hair. All you have to do is sign up in the back. And you can come to Israel with us. I like that. I, I should put some of that stuff on me, you know what? Yeah. Okay. All right, those are the two <clears throat> things I wanted to share with you. But, uh, Lord, I, I just pray, Holy Spirit, I love you, Holy Spirit. Espiritu Santo, te amo. Oh, I love you, Song Yong Nim, if you speak Korean. Song Yong Nim. Oh, I love you, Holy Spirit. There it is. <sighs> Let the glory fall upon us. Let this beautiful church... Be radiated in the glory of God. Saturate, marinate, soak us. Help us to absorb the glory of your presence today. And I pray that every even hint of depression would be driven out of this room. Every despair, every hopeless thought, every uh, mentality or pattern of thinking that has not included God would be lifted from our souls. I pray that you would so speak to us today profoundly that it rocks our world for weeks to come. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to share with you about the hope of the gospel. I have a message of hope for you today. I want to share some jungle stories about what God did for us in the jungle. And I want to conclude with uh, telling you why I want to be honorary members of this church. There's hope for everyone in your family. That messed up person in your family, uh, he may be right next to you, right? Oh, no, don't look at him, but that, that the, the, the one dysfunctional person in your family that you have the hardest time with, have you got him in your head yet? Let me help you. It's the person that you kind of cringe around the holidays to get with. Uh, you know what I'm talking about? The one person that you have given up on in your family, you're going to restore you're going to bring hope to that person, and you're going to be a healer for your family. The Redeemer, the Restorer lives in you. There is no hopeless situation, none. There is no situation that God cannot spin it around. He turns messes into miracles. He'll take a maybe and make it into a miracle. God can turn everything for His good. He'll shift it on a dime if we'll trust Him. And believe him and step out in faith. Now, I've been accused of having the gift of faith, and I want to live up to that remark. And I, I, I really have faith for this church. Matter of fact, I have faith for you. I have faith for, wasn't it great, the new members? You know, that, that's tremendous. Oh, I, pastoring uh, here in Connecticut, I loved that. The, the welcoming new members. The last year I pastored in Connecticut, we baptized 365 people in our church. And we'd, uh, often we would have 50, 60, 70 people come to Christ in a, in a service. Tremendous. Just I, I love everything about, uh, just about everything about pastoring. Um, but the thing that, that I am uh, concerned about or the thing that I'm, I'm motivated in is to get you off, you and I, that we would move away from the shadows of doubt, anxieties, worry, and get us into the light of the hope of God. The Bible speaks of hope like a torch. We hold out the torch of truth, the torch of hope. We extend this light into the nations. And you're an exemplary church of bringing hope to the, to the nations of the world, and I commend you for that. There's nobody that is, the, the vilest offender can be set free. There's nobody outside of the realm of grace. There's nobody God cannot turn around. Even the jerk you're married to, I mean the, the, the person that you live with. Nobody 
is outside of the realm of grace. Let me tell you, if there was one person ever to live that was outside that realm of grace, you're looking at him. I was one messed up puppy. I was a devastated soul. I didn't take drugs. I sold drugs. And do not tell my grandchildren because they really like granddad. I don't want them to know about that stuff. They kind of like me. But I was, I was a, a vile offender. And the Lord set me free. August the 8th, 1971. He set me free. And I know that there are people that you have given up on that God is chasing after. And the key may just be you. The key may be opening your heart to become the healer and the restorer and the hope-filled lover to help another person. I have hope for you. The Bible says in Hebrews 6.19 that we have hope that is an anchor that has gone up into the heavenly realm. You know, most anchors go down. It keeps a ship, of course, from drifting, wandering, whatever. Our anchor goes up. We have an anchor that goes up into the sky, up into the heavenly realm, and there Christ is seated as the one, the forerunner, who's gone ahead of us and keeps us stay safe, secure, steadfast. I look at every person in this room, and, and every one of you are either chained or anchored. You're either chained or you're anchored. Chained to this world and to the difficulties and the anxieties and fears of this world, or you're anchored to a hope that doesn't take into account the weather, lack of sleep, Mustangs. <sighs> difficulties. It's an eternal hope. It's a glorious hope. It's a hope of glory. Jesus in heaven is not the hope of glory. Christ in us now is the hope of glory. We don't have a make-believe hope, so fantasy, wishful hope someday, maybe. No. Dude, that's not my hope. My hope is in me right now. My hope is in me, and it takes me right into the heavenly realm. It's an anchor within me. It's Christ within me. A glorious hope. John calls it the blessed hope. And everyone that has this hope in him finds the power of transformation, of inner transformation. Hope has the power to transform you from the inside out. Well, there's a guy in the Bible by the name of David. You ever heard of him? And he wrote half of the Psalms. He wrote 75 Psalms, and the other authors are uh, various people like the sons of Korah and uh, other people that wrote the psalm. Solomon actually wrote at least one psalm. And some believe Haggai, Zechariah even wrote a psalm or two. But uh, there's a psalm that I want to read just two verses in. And it, it's, it really speaks the message I want to give to you this morning. And it, it says this, Psalm 1818. It should be easy to remember the reference, especially if you read it from, did I mention the Passion <laughs> Translation? Me and Vanna White, we really, we really love sharing this with people. Okay. Psalm 18, 18. When I was at my weakest, my enemies attacked. Isn't that always the case? The enemy wears you down. You get weak. You get tired. You get, uh, you know, stressed. Uh, you have to work with all those people, you know. And, um, of course, they have to work with you, but that's all right. <laughs> and, and it's like when we're vulnerable, that's when the enemy encircles us. And then he hits us with his full onslaught of darkness called depression, despair, hopelessness. And before long, we're, we're in this place where we feel surrounded by our enemies instead of surrounded by God. When I was at my weakest, my enemies attacked, but the Lord held on to me. Aren't you glad the Lord holds on to you at your weakest? His love broke open the way, and he brought me into a beautiful, broad place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. God's going to rescue you because he delights in you. Don't let it go to your head, but like you're his favorite. If you really knew 
how much he loved you, you, you'd understand how spoiled you are. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk with him and love him. I mean, all things are ours in Christ. We've been given every spiritual blessing. If God were to bless you anymore, it would threaten the Trinity. You're fully blessed, beyond the curse. Up one side, down the other, from your nose to your toes, you are a walking blessing, bro. You have been so packed with the favor and mercy of God. He delights in you. And because of that reason, he's going to rescue you. Can I tell you how he rescued me? Oh, which, which one, huh? Which one of the incidents should I give you? How about this one? My wife and I, as you may know, we were tribal missionaries. We worked in the rainforest for eight years. We lived without, uh, tell me when you start feeling sorry for me, then I'll know, I'll feel better. Uh, we, we lived without running water. Actually, we had it. You had to get a bucket and run to the river to get it. We had no electricity. My wife had no curling iron. I mean, dude, like no diet Pepsi, nothing. We, 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 uh, we lived in bark walls, and our nearest neighbor was close enough to hear what you would not ever want to hear. Okay? That's how close the huts were. We were all jammed in this communal-type village, hundreds and hundreds of people. And we were the gringo missionaries that had come to bring the light of the gospel to the people. And the government had accused me of, of us being CIA agents because they couldn't understand why we were there. There were some problems with the drug cartel. We were on the border of Colombia, and we were in a, in a very, very dark, uh, not very pretty area. And a lot of bad people were there. So the government withheld our airplane. They would not let us fly into our jungle airstrip. We had a 1,250-foot grass airstrip. If you know anything about aviation, really short. Special plane designed to get in and get out of that, uh, the, the jungle, and government would let us have it. So we had to go in by banana boat, and we left the city, and we all got on our banana boat. My wife, little five-month-old baby boy who now lives in Chicago, and uh, two daughters, one lives here in uh, Connecticut, the other lives in Charlotte. But anyway, they were just toddlers, okay? Our youngest daughter was five, and, and I guess our oldest daughter would have been seven. Is that right? So we get the banana boat. We chug, 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 chug for a day or two uh, out in the ocean until we come to the mouth of the Chukunaki River. And we chug, chug, chug up the mouth of the Chukunaki River until we get to Yavisa. And there at Yavisa, we unloaded all of our cargo for three months, all of our food, our supplies, really everything we had. And we put it in this very narrow piragua, dugout canoe. It's like a, one tree that had been hollowed out, and that was the way we were going to put an outboard motor on it, a 25-foot Evinrude. And uh, we were going to, you know, push our way up to the headwaters uh, from the Chukunaki into the, uh, into the uh, Pucaro River. And there, while we were unloading our stuff, we got up a ways to the river. We, we stopped and uh, took a break, and then we got back into the canoe, and a flood, a massive flash flood came from the headwaters of the river, from the highlands, of, and had come flashing down. We had no warning, nothing that would alert us to this, and we'd no sooner gone out into the river, and this huge wave with entire trees were bobbing in this massive flood. The, the riverbanks overflowed instantly. It was just crazy. And it picked up our canoe and threw us all into the water. My wife holding on to David, our, our baby, our two daughters, and the bad news is they couldn't swim. And so here we were. They were drowning. And we were racing down this current of a river. I mean, it's like, I'm, I'm going to say like 20 miles an hour. It was like just faster than you'd ever want. It's like an amusement ride without any amusement. And we were flowing down this flooding river. And, and I look over and I see my wife holding David, our five-month-old. And she's drowning. She's going under the water, but she's holding David up to spare his life. And I don't know how you made it to the overturned canoe, but I, I got joy, our, our youngest daughter, our five-year-old, sweetest girl, got her, put her on the overturned bottom of the canoe, 
and, and hoped she wouldn't slide off of that. It was so slippery. And then I went and got Charity, our older daughter, and, and swam over and put her on the canoe. And they were crying. They were like freaking out crying. And, and somehow Candace and David dog paddled over to the canoe. And then I, I was hugging it. And there we were, all five of us. And uh, we called out to God. I didn't know if we we're going to end up in the ocean. That's where rivers go, you know. And so locked into this flow, just trees going by us. Here we are, uninhabited jungle. And out of nowhere, these beautiful dark-skinned people in little tiny canoes, looked like toy canoes. They were angels, I have no doubt. And they came one by one. They took Candace and David, and then uh, one canoe could only take a person at a time. And, and then we got Joy on one. And, of course, now we're going down the river the whole time. Miles separating us, perhaps. Great distance. And uh, finally, I was the last one, and I, I didn't know if I was going to, what was going to happen. But I knew that they were going to be safe. And then finally, I got rescued as well. And there we were. But yet, it started to, it was getting dark. It was getting late. And you can't walk along a river bank. To, you know, I couldn't go back upriver to find my family. I didn't know what I was going to do. And uh, God wonderfully reunited us, and we got rescued. And I, I just thank the Lord for his rescue. When I was at my weakest, love broke through for me. I could tell you more stories. But I want to I give you a, a, somewhat of a prophetic word. I feel like there are people in this room that you're at your weakest. I want to say God is going to break through for you. The God who healed me of amoebic dysentery when I was dying, my eyeballs sunk into my head, my tongue stuck to the roof of my mouth, my wife, likewise, as deathly ill as I was, we're lying there. We'd, I, I'm sure I lost 30 pounds in about, in about uh, 24 hours. Every bodily fluid coming right out of me. Unable to stand. Called for the elders of the church that we planted there in the jungle, started in the jungle. And they came, and with their tears, they asked God not, that we would not die. And God healed us, raised us up. That moment on, the fever left us, and we were on our way to restoration. That God is the God that will heal you. He'll take care of your health issue, the family issue, the child that doesn't ever seem to want anything to do with you. God can restore it all. There's nothing God cannot do. But I, I want to end with, with a, a sense in my heart that financially, there are many of you likewise that need God's love to break through for you. And I, and I feel like for the congregate, for the church and for this building program, I felt it from the Lord, and then my wife's dream confirmed it, that, that uh, God is about to break through for you. God is about to do a miracle because there is a shortfall between what's needed uh, to, to really get this going, and like between now and June, there, there's a real deep financial need. <clears throat> Can I tell you how God supplied for me as a pastor? Uh, we, we ended up getting a campus that was at that time worth I'm going to guess about six million. We had a, a number of buildings on our campus, and and uh, we had a 1,300 seat sanctuary that we filled twice uh, a, a Sunday. But but the the um, it didn't just come overnight. Here's what happened: We were a church of 300. We were meeting on First Street there in West Haven, and and uh, God began to stir my heart that it was time to move, it was time to go on, and I had prophets come into the house and prophesied it to us that we were going to be moving, and, uh, and we found a building, and, and the owner of the building refused to even let us look at it, would not even, he said, there's no way in the world I will ever sell a church, this building, and especially you, and pointed to me, Brian Simmons, especially you, you're never going to have this building, and I was crushed. I immediately went back to the prayer room, fell on my face before God, and, and blew snot out of my nose and cried on the carpet and said, God Almighty, what, are you, what am I to do? He said, bless that person. Just love them and bless them. And don't you say one word to anybody else. There were other witnesses that heard all of that, but I, I did not tell them. So 
what happened? God sent a prophet from another state. Knew nothing about nothing. Went to that pastor, prophesied over him. There's a man in the city that wants this building. You've refused to sell it to him. I am going to unplug you, God says, if you do not let him have that building. Dude, I like prophetic ministry. You're not going to get anywhere with me saying prophets aren't for today, bro. And the, we were on vacation at that point. And the, I get the phones ringing, and, and he, he said, you, you, uh, uh, you got to talk to me. you you got to come. And I said, well, uh, it'll be a few days, but I'll come into your office, and we'll talk. And, and he, in, in his brokenness, said, you're going to have this building. But it's a $6 million campus. Can I tell you how I got a million dollars if I make it quick? You won't believe it. Jesus walked into my hotel room. And he spoke to me. Let's do it like Pastor Glenn, okay? <laughs> You're me, I'm pretend, big pretend, Jesus, all right? About this distance from me, the one I love said to me, so far, he said, Brian, so far, so good. I mean, if Jesus told you that, wouldn't that like, oh, that's better than Mufasa. <laughs> so far, so good. That's awesome. And then he took a step closer to me and he said it again. And I'm bawling. I'm crying. The third time he came right up to my face. And when he said so far, out of his mouth came visible letters. S-O-W. So far, S-O-W, so good, and I will give you your building. I went back to my elders. I said, you're going to have a hard time believing this, but um, a very important person came into my hotel room. <laughs> His name is Jesus, and he told me that if we would take our money and, and give it away, that he would give us a building. And they said, Pastor, you, what are you talking about? I said, well, we're going to empty our bank account. We're going to take our cash flow. We're talking about the money you need in the a bank to cover payroll, my payroll, to cover our staff, the bills, you know, from electricity to whatever. All of the church's finances that we had in our cash account, we took it, tens of thousands, and we sowed it far. We started an orphanage. We started a training center in India. They actually named it after us. We said, don't do that. Don't, 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 don't do that. They said, no, we're going to. There's a gateway training center somewhere in India, somewhere that I'll probably go to someday. And we, we sowed it into ministries far, far away that we knew would not, it wouldn't bounce back to us. And at that time, there was a, a Harvard grad. She was a, a Harvard girl graduating and a Yale guy and, of course, Harvard, Boston, Yale, New Haven. We were in New Haven. So they ended up courting at our church. And they got engaged. That stuff happens. And they asked me if I would do the wedding. I said, great. Where are we going to do it? They said, Seattle. So they flew me to Seattle. I had no clue what I was getting into. Folks, the father of the bride, Bill Gates' best friend. And uh, I just, I would love to give you names, but I'm not going to do that. But I will say this. He was the owner of the Seattle Mariners. Went to the King Stadium there in Seattle. And the, the groom, the night before his wedding, sang the national anthem before how many thousands of people? All the Jumbotrons. Because he was a Yale music grad, vocal grad. Um, <clears throat> went on a yacht later. And uh, our, the wedding party, you know, all of us, I don't know, it's probably 40 or 50 of us in the wedding party, went on his yacht, did a tour of uh, the sound there, and went over by Bill Gates' house and pointed, that's where, that's where Bill lives. He has a heated driveway. I said, what? <laughs> I mean, I've heard of, like in Korea, they have heated toilet seats. Those are kind of nice when it's freezing. You know? Woo! <laughs> but a heated driveway... Said, yeah, he doesn't, you know, he doesn't want to worry about it. So he just, when they built the house, this massive long driveway, he just put heating in it. Underground heating to keep the driveway. 
I'm thinking, man, I got shovels and blowers for that. <laughs> he gets a heated driveway, I get a snowblower. But anyway, the wedding, gorgeous. The flower arrangements. We had symphony. We had dudes in kilts and bagpipes. We had, you wouldn't believe it. The tables, were, the, the flower arrangement was so massively high on every single table. Dude, he dropped a lot of money to get his daughter married. After the wedding, he comes over to my table at the reception, sits right down beside me, and says, hey, thank you for coming to do my daughter's wedding. What can I do for you? <laughs> Just wait. I confess before you and Almighty God, a spirit of stupid came on me. A lying spirit of stupid came on me. And I said, Mr. So-and-so, I am so pleased that you brought me here. I got to go to a, you know, Mariner's game. You took me on your yacht. I saw Bill Gates' house. I mean, this wedding, look, at it's beautiful. And your daughter's so precious. Thank you for bringing me out. I, that's all you need to do for me for the wedding. <laughs> he poked me in the ribs, almost broke one and said, hey, I'm good for 100. He left. I leaned over to my wife. What a cheapskate. He's giving me 100 bucks for doing this wedding. Then his accountant came and sat by and said, Mr. So-and-so wants to know where to wire $100,000 to you for doing the wedding. 100K. So my price for weddings went up. We do real good weddings. So I go back to the elders who, with me, emptied our entire bank account. I slapped the wire transfer paper on the table. I said, Jesus is faithful. He's going to rescue us. Their jaw dropped. They were so shocked. They didn't believe me when I told them. But they had enough faith that God spoke to me that they said, okay, it's your salary. Every one of them pulled out their checkbook and put 50K on the table. Their quarter of a mil and our hundred, there's 350, $350,000 right there. And nobody in the church knew a thing. That next Sunday, wow, did we have fun. I got up and shared with our congregation, I know this is going to be hard to believe, but we're serving a God that is like out of this world. He's so wonderful. And he's given us and I told him the story, you know, and before I could finish the story, a thousand people got out of their chair and emptied their pockets and checkbooks. Six hundred and fifty thousand dollars ended up right here on the altar with the three hundred and fifty that I already had. I had a million bucks in just a matter of days. And we got our building. The rest is history. I'm really done. But I just want to say that God's got miracles ahead for this church. Listen, if he doesn't take us up from here, let's not go anywhere. Unless God's presence go with us, I don't want to go to another building. I don't want to go to a Lord, if you don't go with us. Well, it's only like 50 yards or 50 feet or something. But if you... <laughs> that doesn't quite... That verse doesn't quite fit, but we'll make it overlap a little. If you don't go over here with us, <laughs> I want God's presence, don't you? And I'm telling you, the presence of the Lord is going to be with you over the next few weeks. Miracles are going to happen, financial miracles. God is a mighty God. He'll put you on a yacht, a nobody. He'll come into your room, melt the wall, and come right in and speak to you the revelation secrets nothing God can't do. If he can rescue me from dysentery, if he can get us and our family through that horrible snake bite our daughter went through, our missionary friends that were martyred in the jungle, and still the church is strong and thriving, supernatural miracles breaking loose in the rainforest. If God can rescue us from a flooding river and spare my family, God's going to work for you. He's going to do what no one else can do. I mean, bankers won't do it. Are you kidding? Bankers ain't going to do it. 
You think some big lawyer is going to help? It's going to be a big God. Put your faith in the living God. Some will trust in horses and chariots and bankers and credit cards. I'm going to put my faith in the name of the living God. Watch God work in the next few weeks. Miracles, miracles are coming to you. Would you stand up, please? Father, I pray for this beautiful church. I pray, God, that you'll bust the walls out, put those cement foundations in. That, Lord, that we'll just celebrate all summer long as we come into church and we see this building, the foundation starting, and we begin to see the process underway, the hustle and bustle of construction workers and, and trucks and gravel and cement and steel and, and, and electrical wires and all of the... the you know, the, the ceiling, the, the roofing, the, the new building that you're going to give to this church. And it's not even big enough for the harvest that's coming. Not even, it's going to be full the first Sunday we get in there. So Lord, I pray financial miracle so far and so good. And I'll give you what's impossible to men. There's something about extravagant, hilarious, crazy, you're out of your mind giving. Like giving up a V8 smoking hot red caramel top convertible. Did I mention the 8 CD player? Eight. Sounds so sweet. Chick magnet. It was, my wife doesn't like me to say that, but I'd go through the drive through windows and all these girls are oh I like them I felt 10 years younger until I got slapped whatever you give whatever you surrender you put it in the fire it becomes love on the other side it becomes a miracle on the other side it becomes what only God can do Pastor Glenn, thank you for the privilege of being with you. You guys are so amazing. Tell the person next to you a miracle is coming to you. Give him a big hand, everybody. Jesus is in the house. Lift up your face. Lift up your hands. Let's lift up the name of Jesus. Come on, say that name of Jesus. Come on, take that name of Jesus on your lips. Jesus, we worship you. Jesus, we honor you. Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we magnify you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Everyone look at me for just one moment. Every business plan and every battle plan in the Bible has one thing in common. If God does not show up with a miracle, it would never work. I want to tell you something, beloved. Phase two is not in the business plans of man. It is in the supernatural, mysterious workings of the Spirit of God. It is not by might. It is not by power. It is not by the intelligence of Wall Street bankers or worldly investors. It is the, the ways of the kingdom. Moses said, God, teach me your ways. Show me heaven's strategies that bring heaven's results. So far, so good. And watch what God will do. God came, you know, when, when we have a need, I, and I, I didn't I didn't tell Pastor Brian and Candace about our building. We, we didn't have time to talk about it all weekend. There wasn't time. We had no conversation. I didn't tell them about the need we have. We have a gap right now between what we have, and there's about a $3 million gap we have to close before we can start construction on phase two. I didn't tell them, but Friday evening during the Greenwich outpouring meeting, I was sitting in my seat and I prayed and I asked God, I said, God, would you give us the first $1 million that we need in the next 10 days for phase two? Come on, does anybody have faith this morning to believe that God could do that? 
it's all out there on the line because I don't have a million dollars. We don't have a million dollars. But nothing is too difficult for the Lord. Nothing is too hard for him. He owns all. He said all the gold is mine. All the silver is mine. God knows where the hidden treasure of the earth is buried. Nothing's too hard. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills and he owns the hills. Jesus never carried any money on him. Jesus never had to carry. When, when they asked him about taxes, he said, give me a coin because he had no money on him. He never carried money on him because he had the authority from the Father to requisition whatever he needed whenever he needed it. And he's given us that authority as well. Come on, I want you to lift your hands with me. And then Pastor Brian has one thing he wants to share. And then lift your hands. Come on, would you agree with me? This is all out there on the line because I don't have a million bucks. We don't have a million bucks. But I'm asking God, first $1 million in the next 10 days for phase two. Would you just pray and agree with me? Jesus said, if two of you will agree, touching anything on earth, it shall be done. Come on, this isn't some, this building, listen, it's not just a big fancy thing that we want. We need, we desperately need phase two. I want to tell you, this congregation is so big, phase two is already completely filled. The sanctuary is already completely filled. The lower level classrooms and spaces, this congregation is big enough. On day one, we will fill that building to the max already. We're going to have to be in multiple services from the very beginning just to accommodate. Would you agree with me in faith right now? Come on, agree with me in faith. God, one million, would you ask him? God, we agree in the name of Jesus. God, we're asking one million dollars in the next 10 days for phase two. Lord, nothing. We are fully persuaded. We are fully convinced, Lord. Nothing is too hard for the Lord. Nothing is too difficult. God, would you work in the supernatural way that only you can work? Would you do what only you can do? Father, in Jesus' name, God, would you work? God, would you multiply seed? God, I pray this would be a week of miracles for the people of God. Father, I pray, Lord, that this would be a week of promotions and bonuses and sales and commissions. Father, I pray that phones would ring. I pray that emails would bing. I pray that there would be physical knocks on people's doors. I pray you'd even send angelic messengers, God, to people's doors right now. Lord and Father, bearing good news and glad tidings of great joy, Father, and bringing news of opportunity. Lord, I pray there would be conversations in back offices, Lord, about your people. We were just discussing you, and you're just the man, you're just the woman for the position that we have. Lord, I thank you that positions are going to be created especially to accommodate your people, Lord, that they're going to get upgraded. I pray for every small business owner in this congregation that you would blow out their businesses. I pray that the phones would ring faster than they could answer. I pray that they would have the pick of the best jobs. Lord, I pray. Lord, I pray for accounts receivable, Lord, that have been written off as losses. God, I pray that you'd make the thief pay up seven times. Lord, I pray that it would all come in, that all the money that is owed would come in, Lord. Everything that's due with interest, with back due wages. Come on, somebody's owed back due wages. God, I release back due wages in the name of Jesus. Money that people are entitled to, money that people were um, just sidelined out of in inheritances. Father, I thank you for just releasing it. There's going to be favorable court settlements. Lord, you're going to cause the heart of the judge to turn favorably towards your people because they please you, Lord. Father, we thank you for it. In Jesus' name. Come, Pastor Brian. Pastor Brian asked me permission to just share one more thing, and then we're going to go in just a minute. We don't have a Mustang to give, and I can't give my rental car. Hertz would come after me. But the Lord spoke to my wife and I that the offering we're going to receive right now for us, give a big check because it's we're going to give it to the building program. All the money that's come this weekend for us, we want to sow it. We want to put it, put our mouth where our heart is, and uh, or our heart where anyway, yeah, yeah. We're gonna do that. So uh, thank God. I can't wait to come back and see the dedication as an honorary member who sowed into this project. I can't wait to come back and celebrate, rejoice with you. God is mighty. God is big. Amen. 
You know, last, last weekend, Paul Wilbur told me, Pastor Glenn, I really want to come back for the dedication of phase two. So it's going to be Paul Wilbur and Brian Simmons on the ticket when we dedicate phase two. There was, a, there was an offering envelope in your bulletin this morning, a second one, for an offering for Brian Candace, which they're turning over to us. And, you know, somebody, somebody just brought $100 and laid it here on this altar. And uh, I want to ask you to do this to close. Would you put a gift in that offering envelope and would you bring it and lay it here on the altar and uh, bring it with joy. Bring it as a seed of faith. Just believing that God can take my, my loaves and fishes and your loaves and fishes and he can just turn them into something spectacular. And we're going to give that way. I'm so thankful for Jason Gregory being here. Afi, are you here? Uh, Afi, are you here in the sanctuary with us? Is, is Afia here, uh, Jason's beautiful wife? Um, I can't see her, her little hand. Afia, step out into the altar, would you? You're behind Big Jeremy Ziegler there. All right. This is Afia. This is Jason's beautiful wife. Would you welcome her? And uh, thank you so much for being with us this weekend. Guys, can you give, can you give us something something joyful? We're gonna go out just uh, with something joyful, celebratory. If you have a gift to give, um, bring it and lay it here on the altar. And after you've given, our annual report is Wednesday evening at seven o'clock. Get gave me a, a word to share for the congregation during the annual report at seven on Wednesday evening. So we'd love to see you. God bless you, everybody. Come on, hug somebody. Tell them it's gonna be a great week in Jesus. And after you've given, you can go. God bless you. With the crowd of praise.